Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, join me in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark chapter 11 is where we are going to be this morning. If you are new to Springfield Assembly or if this is your first time in a long time, uh, we launched this series over a year ago. And with a few breaks here and there, we have made it to the middle of chapter 11. If you missed any of the teachings so far, or if you want a refresher, you can head over to our website at springfieldassembly.net, or you can go to our YouTube channel, find us on Facebook, all of those things, you can find the sermons there. Uh, so we'll be in Mark chapter 11, starting with verse 15. In this series, we've been traveling verse by verse through the gospel of Mark, and I've loved this series so far. I've heard so many people say, man, the timing of these messages was just perfect for them. And, and we've seen, even as we've been marching through this for well over a year now, how God has just aligned certain Sundays up with what's happening in our church, which what's happening around the world, in our country. And we're just, we just know that's what God does. That's just what God does. And so uh, God's word is so powerful. And we go verse by verse because when we take it all in together, Kind of get that full counsel of God from one book. It really just gives us a depth and a richness that we wouldn't get if we just jumped around. Uh, this morning's message, which is part, who knows, 43 maybe, uh, 42, 40 something or other, um, is, uh, is entitled The Temple Cleansing. So this morning's message is entitled The Temple Cleansing. So again, if you have your Bibles, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version Starting with verse 15, it says this. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Let's pray. God, this is your word this morning and we thank you for it. We thank you that it speaks to us. We thank you that it gives life. We thank you that it challenges us. We thank you that there is life and power found in it. So now, God, we ask that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to our church this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, what a scene that we've just read. What a powerful scene. And the thing is, we've been here before. We've been here before. Palm Sunday, to be exact, just a couple of months ago, we read this exact passage except from Matthew's gospel. And because we looked at the heart of this passage not too long ago, which is Jesus cares more about the temple than he does about the palace, meaning he cares about his church more than the seat of power in a country, because it is Jesus who established his church, not a government. And he cares about his temple. He cares about his church. And not only does he care about his temple, he cares about your temple. Because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus longs to clean your spiritual house as well. And that's what truly is the heart of this passage. That Jesus cares deeply about the state of your heart. And I encourage you to jump back into the uh, first Sunday in April. If you'd like to listen to that message, you can. But this morning, I want to look at this passage from a different angle. Now, if you were with us last week, we actually skipped over this passage because we looked at the fig tree and we wanted to get kind of the beginning and the end of the fig tree narrative. And so now we're kind of back here where Jesus is now cleansing the temple. And so verse 15 starts off by saying, and they came to Jerusalem. So as a reminder, this happens the day after Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem. So on the triumphant entry, Palm Sunday is what we call it, Jesus 
comes in with all the palm branches, all the cloaks on the ground. He comes into the city where in Mark's account, he kind of pokes his head in the temple, sees what's going on. But because it was late in the evening, he makes his way back out to Bethany. So they were journeying back into Jerusalem after staying the night in Bethany. And this is what the temple experiences, Jesus coming in on the scene. And this happens right after Jesus cursed the fig tree we looked at last week. So the second half of verse 15 says, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Let's look at two words. I have them underlined there in the text. But this, let's look at the idea of what Jesus did. And the first thing that Jesus did was he, it says that he drived out, right? It was that he drived out those who sold and those who bought. This is a very strong word. It's a forceful action. We see in John chapter 2 where Jesus cleanses the temple for the first time and he does this with a whip. Now there's no indication in Mark's text that he would actually have a whip, but it's the same picture. This was a forceful action. He was not asking politely. He wasn't saying, hey, guys, 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 hey, 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 everybody over here. Hey, can you guys just shh, bring it down? Hey, there's, a, there's some things happening. Can you, excuse me, ma'am, sir, excuse me, pigeon seller, hey, real quick. No, 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 no. He was forcing them. He was passionately pushing them out of the temple of God. He was doing all that he could to drive them out of the house of God. So not only was he passionate in his driving out of the people using his words, I'm sure he was channeling his inner Mediterranean, probably a little Italian in him, and he was using his hand, get out of here. But then he overturned he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. If he was passionate in his verbiage in driving out, oh, he was much more so now in his action in overturning the tables and the seats. Have you ever seen a table flipped over? It's not pretty. Most of the times in current culture, it happens in the middle of a game of Monopoly. But here, Jesus is disrupting not only who's standing there, but the people who have set up shop there. And he is overturning. He is flipping their tables and their seats. And I don't think you can do that politely either. Excuse me, sir, could you just back up real quick? I'm about to flip your table over. I'm sorry, sir, could you stand up just for a moment? I'm just going to kick your seat over. I just don't want you to get hurt. I don't want it to, I just, here, I just be, be very careful. Don't trip. But Jesus is coming in to his father's house in the same temple where Isaiah had the picture of God in Isaiah chapter 6, the same place where the Spirit of God fell when they dedicated the temple. It is in this place where Jesus comes in and he drives out all of those who ought not to be there, who are there for all the wrong reasons, and those who have set up shop, he overturns their tables and kicks them out. He's fulfilling Second half of Zechariah chapter 14, verse 21. In that verse it says, And on that day there will no longer be traitors in the temple of the Lord of heaven's armies. That was the day. Zechariah 14, 21 says, And on that day, and that was the day that Jesus did just that. Then verse 16 it goes on to describe that he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Now what does that mean? Now, Jesus here, not only was he driving people out, not only was he flipping tables, but he was halting the traffic of those who were using what was called the court of the Gentiles, where all this was happening. He was pushing away people that were using that as a cut through or a shortcut to get to the other side of the city. 
And why was it important that it was keeping those from carrying anything? Because it had been made law there in Jerusalem by the chief priest that you could not carry your shoes or your staff or your wallet into the temple. Because that meant if you left them on the outside, you were just coming in to do the Lord's work and then you want to go back out and get your stuff. So if you were carrying something through the temple, that means you were just cutting through. That you were using the temple as a shortcut to get from point A to point B. And Jesus was not allowing anyone to carry anything through the temple. There were laws and provisions that were supposed to keep the temple from being treated as a pass-through, but no one was stopping them. So Jesus came and he said his house, his temple is not for shortcuts, it's for worship. Then verse 17 goes on and he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The call for the temple to be a house of prayer for the nations was a direct quotation of Isaiah 56 verse 7 and stated the main purpose for the court of the Gentiles where they were. The court of the Gentiles was to be a place where the Gentiles could come for prayer and to seek God. But as it was, it was impossible to concentrate on anything, much less pray and worship. It was more about the hustle and bustle of the selling of the things so you could do your religious duties than it was about connecting to the living God. This desecration of the court of the Gentiles was a massive national sin against God and his heart for the lost people of the world. It was doubly serious at this Passover time when the heart of the Jewish religion was especially revealed. And then he, Jesus refers to this place as now a den of robbers, which is a quote from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. The high priest's family had perverted the temple worship into a means of extortion. And this was not secretive. It was well known by all. The real shame and the crime of this was the spiritual robbery or theft performed against the Gentiles. And indeed, all seeking the God of Israel. Their ability to seek God was being perverted from what true worship was to look like. The nations were being pushed out because the robbers had come in in the form of religious leaders to make a profit. Verse 18 says, in the chief Priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Let's break down this passage real quick. First, who are they? Well, they are the the scribes or the chief priests. The chief priest was to be from the tribe of Levi and was supposed to be the only one allowed into the Holy of Holies. And he would just do that one time a year to make atonement for the sins of Israel. It seems that sometime after the fall of Jerusalem and the time of Jesus, there is now almost a committee or a cohort of chief priests, plural. A council, if you will. These men would have been keen both on biblical law, what the word of God were to teach and to say, but they would also be very keen on the practice of what it looked like to be a devoted Jew. Scribes, they had a knowledge of the law and they could draft legal documents, contracts for marriage, divorce, loans, inheritance, mortgages, the sale of land and the like. The church at the time was the hub of many of these transactions and so these scribes who would have known all the laws, be able to write those laws and be able to put those laws in legal form so that people could make contracts when they would make transactions. So these two groups, the chief priests, And the scribes would have been keenly aware of the verses that Jesus just quoted in Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah 7, 11. That's who are they. Now, what did they do? Well, they heard it. They heard the teaching of Jesus. 
So with full understanding of Jesus' words, fully aware of what Jesus was referencing, they heard the teaching of Jesus. They heard Jesus reference the prophecies from Isaiah and Jeremiah. They heard Jesus bring the correction to the crowd. And no doubt they saw Jesus bring the correction too in physical form. They heard Jesus teach. They saw him correct. But yet they had the opposite effect. What they saw, what they heard had the opposite effect of the crowd. The crowd was astonished. The word is not a passive astonishment like, oh, wow, how cool is that? What a, what a, what a crazy thought. What a great idea. This paints a picture of being struck of physically being hit with astonishment. So things were going great. <laughs> now, whether they were physically hit by Jesus, we're not sure. You know, he did, again, he didn't have a whip in this story. But they were, they were struck with astonishment. They were taken back. It was like they were punched in the gut with what they had heard Jesus say. This was something that, that was much deeper than just, wow, what a, what a passionate young man that, that he must be. Wow, what... Look at him, is that that Jesus fella? No, they were absolutely taken back, struck with astonishment at what they had seen and heard from Jesus. They were startled, they were awakened by the words of Jesus. They were shocked and in awe of Jesus. Now what that meant as far as fruit from those in the crowd, we don't know. But what we do know was that the crowd was struck with astonishment. They were in awe, and the religious, they reacted differently. What they heard caused them to react a totally different way. They were closed off, and they were ready to do something drastic. So that's our next question. How did they respond? Well, they responded with trying to seek a way to destroy Jesus. They responded to the physical discipline of Jesus and the spiritual rebuke of Jesus from the word of God with, with hatred. And as we'll see in a few moments, more likely envy from what Jesus would do. They wanted to kill Jesus and they plotted to do just that. So why? Another question, why, why hate and envy? Why so much disdain? And the text tells us it was because they feared him. They were threatened. The very existence of Jesus threatened all that they had, all that they had built, their identity, and their influence. Why did they fear him? Well, they feared him, as the text would say, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. They feared him because the crowd was never astonished at their teaching. With the entrance of such zeal and passion and power in Jesus, now in the temple, Jesus had become a threat to steal their followers and to turn these followers away from the religion that they had built to benefit them to a religion that worshiped the one true God. And then Jesus abruptly leaves. And ultimately, in his leaving, sealed his destiny to die on a cross, to rise again, and then to reign forever in eternity. So that's our story. So what does that mean for us this morning? What does that mean for us this morning? Now I want to take a look at who Jesus is in this text. I want to look at who Jesus is in this passage. If you look at old Renaissance period art depictions of Jesus, six foot three, blonde hair, blue eyes, like most people from that part of the world, it's not at all what they look like. But Jesus looks like he would be more fit for a jamming out guitar session near a beach somewhere. You know, it, this is a, this kind of passage kind of throws Jesus into a whole nother light. Like Jesus is, 
is his robe is supposed to, it looks like it's pressed every time he, in those paintings, right? It's just, he's just got it freshly ironed or steamed perhaps, and, and he doesn't have any mud on him ever. It's not like he's walking these dirty, dusty streets and traveling everywhere. Jesus always looked like he has just had a facial, a manicure. Uh, you can't see because his robe's too long, but we can all assume a pedicure. And he is just, he is, he is nice. He just smiles at everybody and says, God bless you, and he just keeps moving on. This, this picture is totally different. That's why I wanted to make sure I explained it in such a way. Jesus was not politely driving people out of the temple. He was not courteously flipping over their tables. This is a side of Jesus that we don't like to even imagine exists, but it does. In biblical terms, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Qualities that we consider to be lamb-like, gentleness and meekness, are indeed in Christ. But so is the regalness and the ferocity of a lion. Our Savior is also our judge. We cannot forget that. The scriptures speak of the wrath of the lamb in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. To be sure, Jesus, no doubt, is the meekest, gentlest person who's ever lived. He said himself in Matthew 11, 29, I am gentle and lowly in heart. He also said in Matthew 5, 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. But understand this, meekness is not weakness. We don't use that term a whole lot. I've never really heard anyone describe anybody as meek. But meekness is not weakness. Meekness is rather strength under control. It is power restrained. A person can only be meek if they have power. Meekness has the strength to not defend oneself. Think of Jesus as he is on his way to the cross. At any moment, he could have ended it, but he chose to not. It was meekness that put Jesus on the cross. But meekness will also boldly defend others. And here Jesus struck out in defense of the holiness of God his Father as he cleansed the temple. Jesus is holy. His father is holy. And his temple, his people should be holy as well. So here's the conclusion and the take home question I wanna ask us today. What is your reaction to correction? Or to Christian rebuke? Jesus came and brought order to his house. Rebuke and correction to those that were in the wrong. One crowd was struck to the core and they were astonished at what Jesus taught. The others took that same rebuke, that same challenge from the word of God, the same challenge from Jesus who was the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. They took that same correction and they wanted to kill him and keep their religion the way that they wanted it that benefited them. If we are honest, no one likes correction. No one likes to be disciplined. However, the author of Hebrews in chapter 12 verse 6 teaches us that The Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. If you are a parent here today, if you've ever been a parent, you know what this verse is talking about. Nobody wants to punish their kids, but we know that we discipline our kids because we love our kids and we want them to be a fully functional and benefit to society, a a follower of Jesus, someone who has 
integrity, someone who is a person of honesty, someone who knows how to act the right way in the right time in the right situations. And the only way we do that is by discipline and instruction and correction when needed. Jesus clearing the temple and driving out the money changers and flipping over the chairs of those who were selling pigeons, this was not a fit of rage. This isn't Jesus just having an angry outburst. This was an act of love for God and for the people of God. And if you are a believer this morning, there are two ways to respond to rebuke and correction. You can let it penetrate your heart, strike you, repent, and turn back to God. Or you can, or you can allow your heart to be hardened by getting angry or just brushing it off. So how do you respond to correction or to rebuke? Correction from the word of God. Conviction from the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps the correction or rebuke from someone who loves you. How do you respond? And church, let me just challenge you with this. If you are not regularly being convicted or corrected by the Holy Spirit or by the word of God, then you have either reached perfection or you've stopped listening to the voice of God. Or... You've not picked up your Bible in a very long time in order for it to convict you. You know, it's it's tough to meet people who willfully admit that they're wrong because all of us think we're right. And in today's culture, apparently you can have a truth and I can have a truth and you can have a truth and our truths can be Uh, total opposites of each other, but hey, it's not a big deal. But God is truth. God is not a man that he would lie. His word is truth. And we have to allow that truth to continually convict us and correct us and challenge us and discipline us. Here's what I want you to know. You are not called to fit into this world. You are not called to fit in to this world. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 calls us aliens and strangers in this world. Or one translation, temporary residents and foreigners. I know it's a term that gets thrown around a lot, but just in case you were wondering, you're an alien. Some of you sit next to someone, it's all starting to make sense right now. Like, yeah, all the signs were pointing to it. But you are an alien. You are a temporary resident in this world. I love my country. Sunday I will celebrate its birthday on our Independence Day. I'm grateful to call this place home, and I'm grateful for those who have fought and defended our freedoms at home and abroad. But can I say something? My birth certificate says I was born in East Tennessee. But this world is not my home. My driver's license says that I am a resident of Ohio. But this world is not my home. As much as in the laws of the land I am a citizen of the United States of America, I am not. As Philippians chapter 3.20 tells us, We are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. We are called to, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ, Philippians 1.27. My life should not make sense to the world. How I act, what I do, what I believe, what I stand upon should not make sense to the world because I am no longer a part of this world. I am a citizen of heaven. 
I've traded in the earthly and the worldly for the heavenly. So my eyes are fixed much higher than what this world's eyes are set on. My life should not line up with the world. My beliefs and convictions should not be formed by the policies and the laws of this land. As a citizen of heaven, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It is on Christ, the solid rock I stand, because all other ground is sinking sand. I don't have to have the news to tell me what I should believe. I don't, I don't need the culture to tell me what I should believe. I don't, I don't need society to tell me what I should believe or what I should accept or what is right because I have the word of God and the Holy Spirit sealing my spirit inside to tell me what is true. Because what the world thinks is true today will change in a week, will change in a month. The line keeps shifting, the target keeps moving. As our culture gets more and more and more and more and more away from the truth of God. We have to, as believers, find ourselves falling more and more and more and more in love with his word and with his spirit. We have to be willing to let the spirit of God convict us rebuke us, and challenge us. And how we respond to that will make all the difference in the world, in our lives today. When I was a teenager, I wanted so desperately to fit in. Music I listened to, movies I watched, hairstyles, can't we all just, there's no judgment in the house today. How many of you, you've had your hair styled in a way that now when you look back on it, you just know the devil was a part of it. You were just like, you know what, I, Lord, I rebuke that perm in Jesus' name. I, that mullet is not of you, Lord, and I see that now. Listen, I've seen old directories of this church. And somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a mullet competition that only a few were invited to, but they were serious about it, okay? I've seen it. We're not going to call names just yet. Sometimes we do so many things to fit in. We, do, we try to do so much just to, to be a part of the crowd or a part of the norm or just to be accepted by culture and society where Scripture does not ask us to do that. We are aliens and strangers and citizens of heaven. And they hated Jesus, and so they're going to hate us. And we have to be willing to walk that, to let the Spirit of God change us and challenge us and correct us, to let the Word of God dictate what we believe. Because if we get too focused in on just building a good world for us that is religious in nature, but void of the power and the spirit of God, we will find ourselves like the Pharisees. That when the correction comes, when the rebuke comes, instead of changing and bowing our knees to Jesus and submitting, we will try to kill him and his voice in our lives. And ultimately seal our fate. I love Southern gospel music. Y'all may not know that about me. But just because I use the word y'all, you should have a little bit of an understanding that I am Southern by culture. Even though I grew up in Naples, Florida, which you would think is as, almost as Southern as you can get. Nope, in Florida, the more South you go, the more Northern the culture is, right? But I was born in East Tennessee. All my families, we are proud hillbillies, all right? We're not rednecks, we are hillbillies, all right? There's a big difference. What's the difference? Well, we're from hills, all right? The Appalachians, okay? <laughs> but we are hillbillies and we're very proud of it. So I grew up and Southern gospel music was a big part 
of our family and uh, family members that played or sang in Southern Gospel groups. And I had a great aunt who owned a radio st- or did a radio station, and she did all of her Southern Gospel music. But there was a song, This World Is Not My Home, I'm Just a Passing Through. Just a passing through. Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, they took their eyes off of an eternal reward and they turned their religion into something that just benefited them at the cost of others. And when the Son of God showed up and brought correction and rebuke, they couldn't see it because they were so wrapped up in religion. They were so wrapped up in doing things their own way that they couldn't hear Jesus' rebuke. So my challenge for us this morning, church, is to be sensitive to the word of God. To not be twisted and formed by a culture, by a society that is trying to redefine all the terms, all the things. To stand on the word of God. To go back to a childlike faith that would say the B-I-B-L-E, that is the book for me. I'm going to stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. That's when someone goes, Bible. Okay, you didn't do it. It's okay. Because I don't want to be a Pharisee who turns church into just a business transaction of what I can get out of it for me. I want to be like the followers of Jesus who were willing to sell everything and do everything just to help meet the needs of people, who would be willing to forsake everything to follow Jesus, who would leave family and friends to just follow Jesus, who would be willing to do anything and everything and even die for their Savior. Living for Jesus in today's culture will probably get you canceled. That's okay. This isn't my home. I'm not living for that. I'm living for Jesus. And that's what Jesus was calling people to do. My temple, my house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. So let's make sure this house is. Let's make sure your hearts are so that we don't miss Jesus when he comes on the scene. As Stephen comes up and we get ready to close. Let me ask you these questions. How's your temple? Are you busy doing everything but what God has called you to do? Are you taking the easy way out, taking shortcut after shortcut? Or is your heart on the altar, open for God to correct, open for God to discipline? Are you inviting Jesus to flip over any table that ought not to be there? To drive out any thought or belief that ought not to be there? Because if you're not, then your heart could be at the place where the Pharisees were. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Pharisee. Just someone who just knows enough about Jesus to be dangerous in conversation, but whose heart is so far from what Jesus has come to do.